All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our new training, An Assault on Liberty, the Growing Threat Posed by the Conservative Supreme Court. We're going to talk tonight um, about this leaked Dobbs decision, um, what it means for you know, the future of accessing abortion, but also its larger implications um, on all the issues that we care about. Uh, my name is Julia Peter. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the campaign director for our work around the federal judiciary. Um, and I'll kick it to you, Michelle. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Kilpatrick. I'm C Senior Federal Policy Analyst at CPD. I use she, her pronouns. And can we move to the next slide? I don't think I have access. Okay. Um, so I wanted to start off tonight talking about sort of the role that the Supreme Court has played uh, sort of in our cultural imagination, our, our general understanding. So um, for a couple of generations now, the Supreme Court has been thought of as this institution that is kind of a bulwark against a tyranny of the majority or the um, persecution of groups that have been marginalized, um, that it has been this, uh, this institution that can protect individuals from the excesses of the state. Um, and that, that uh, understanding of the Supreme Court's role um, really started with Brown v. Board as a landmark decision, um, finding segregation in public schools unconstitutional. That was the launch of a period of a, a bunch of landmark decisions um, that expanded uh, the rights of individuals and limited the ability of the state to, uh, to deprive people of rights, whether it was um, children in schools or um, people who are accused of a crime or a, an entire uh, range of landmark opinions over the next 20 years. And next slide. So the fact is that that period of the court's history is actually not representative of the, the long history of the court. For most of the court's history, it has protected the rights of the wealthy and the powerful. It has been on the side of corporate interests, business interests, slave owning interests, um, not on the side of workers or people who were persecuted or oppressed by the status quo. And next slide. And so this period, this sort of 20 or 30 years, depending on when you start counting, um, really it, it created this uh, understanding of the Supreme Court in the public imagination. It also inspired a backlash, right? The, the folks who were in favor of the Supreme Court, or sorry, of the status quo, the folks are, who are on the conservative side of things didn't just accept this change from the court. Um, instead, they launched what was a decades long campaign to take back the court. So from for the last 40 plus years, there has been an effort to develop institutions that could um, shape uh, legal ideologies. There are law schools and institutions that are focused on developing the kind of reasoning and logic that attorneys or judges can use uh, to roll back some of those landmark cases. Um, there's also been this grooming of uh, from from law school or even pre-law um, through becoming an attorney, becoming a judge, getting to the federal bench and eventually getting to the Supreme Court. There was a development of a sort of pipeline um, all with the goal of reversing uh, not just Roe, but a number of decisions that uh, folks were not happy with from this previous time period. Next slide. All right. Um, yeah, let's take a minute and talk about the justices themselves. So the Supreme Court currently is made up of nine justices. There's nothing really special about that number. It's changed throughout history, um, a bit more on that later. Um, but these justices are nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate to lifetime appointments. Um, so, First year, I think many of you will recognize parents whose wife we've known for a long time has close ties um, to the Trump administration. But the news that has come out um, and evidence that has come to light in the last few months um, just shows how close her ties to the Trump administration really are, and also her potential involvement in the January 6th insurrection. So, definitely something to watch closely there. 
Um, next up here, Chief Justice Roberts you might remember him from overseeing Trump's impeachment trial, which was notable because there was, you know, a lack of witness testimony at that trial. It's also, you know, we're in this <clears throat> really weird, wild world where he's kind of considered um, a swing vote among the Republicans, even though he himself has been responsible for some truly, truly awful, extremely partisan decisions, particularly around voting rights. Um, then finally, um, we have Justice Alito here, kind of unfortunately the man of the hour. He's the one that authored this draft decision um, on Dobbs that we're discussing tonight. Uh, we can go to the next slide and we're going to look at what we're calling the MAGA court. You know, these are the justices um, that we have Trump to thank for. Um, first up here is Gorsuch. Kind of the unfun fact that we can share about him is that he sits in the stolen, in Merrick Garland stolen seat. Um, of course, I know folks in this call will unfortunately recognize this next guy, Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Um, who at the time of his confirmation had 83 open ethics complaints, um, including, of course, the credible allegations, sexual assault allegations from Dr. Ford. Important to take a moment and note here that the Supreme Court doesn't have a code of ethics. It's our least accountable um, branch of government. So, you know, something else really important to look at and a bit more on that later. Um, and then finally here we have Amy Coney Barrett, who of course was confirmed during an act like active election. People were actively voting while she was confirmed. Um, also just to note kind of pertinent to our discussion tonight during the oral arguments, she actually um, posed the question whether kind of safe haven laws, <coughs> excuse me, eliminated um, the burden of pregnancy for abortion seekers. So really horrendous stuff, um, of course, coming from Justice Barrett. So here we have just some highlights or lowlights of the last decade um, uh, on uh, Supreme Court decisions that have been undermining our democracy and access to voting. Um, and what's really, I won't go through the details of these here, you can see them on the screen, um, but what's really um, uh, important to note in light of the leaked opinion um, is that one of the sort of arguments that Alito makes in that is we're not, all we're doing is giving this decision back to the states. So if you don't like what your state government is doing uh, when it comes to reproductive health, you can organize and vote them out. Um, he's making that statement after the Supreme Court has had a number of decisions um, that have either uh, undermined our democracy um, or has uh, have facilitated um, state and local governments that have been looking for ways to block access uh, to voting. And so this idea that, that we're just making this a question of electoral politics instead of uh, constitutional law is really kind of a red herring from the very same court that gutted the Voting Rights Act um, that allowed for purging of voter rolls and that um, uh, handed down the decision in C Citizens United. Um, next slide. So getting into the decision itself. So uh, one thing I do want to emphasize is as of right now, there has been no change in the law. The decision that was leaked was a draft decision. Uh, the process that the Supreme Court goes through when they're deciding a case, there will be uh, drafts written by uh, the justices who are the majority. Uh, there may be concurring or dissenting drafts that are also written at the same time. They circulate those drafts and they kind of talk to each other through circulating those drafts. And it can happen that wording changes or positions change in that process. Um, all that being said, uh, the decision that was leaked uh, is one that, at least as of the time of the leak, according to the reporting by Politico, um, had already been joined by uh, the four uh, conservative justices in addition to Alito himself. Um, and these are justices who were basically put on the court as part of this long-term campaign to reverse Roe. And so the expectation is that even if some of the details of the language change, um, the fundamental effect of the opinion is not expected to change. Um, so with all that being said, um, just starting with the immediate impact. So the day that if this decision becomes the decision of the court, 
um, the immediate impact is that in 22 states, abortion will be criminalized. That's There are 13 states that have what are called trigger laws, um, which basically say, if and when Roe is reversed, abortion is criminalized in this state. Um, and so those states will immediately, uh, abortion will no longer be accessible. Um, there are nine others that are, uh, that have laws on the books. Some of them are laws that have been on the books since before Roe came down. Some of them were passed after Roe, um, but they haven't, they're not enforceable. They're basically what's called dead letter law um, because of Roe and another uh, case called Casey. Um, if Roe is reversed, they, those become um, enforceable laws again. Um, and there are another four states that the Guttmacher Institute predicts will uh, criminalize abortion within months or at least within a year. It's, it, they may have to um, wait till the legislature meets or you know certain bureaucratic hurdles, but they are poised to uh, criminalize abortion as soon as they're able to. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the impact that this will have, so first it's important to note that wealthy and powerful people have always and will always have access to abortions. That was true long before Roe, um, and it, it will remain true if and when Roe is reversed. Um, people who have uh, resources, who have access to healthcare, who have money to travel, have always been able to access abortions. The people who uh, criminalize, who are impacted by the criminalization of abortion are people who are low income, people who are uh, recent immigrants, uh, black, indigenous, people of color, um, people who have fewer resources to be able to say travel to a state where abortion is legal. Um, and so one example of this is if you're a person who lives in Mississippi, the nearest clinic uh, would be in Illinois, it would be 400 miles each way. Um, and so if you can't get time off of work, if you can't get childcare uh, for your existing children, if you don't have a car that can make an 800 mile round trip or can't afford plane tickets, all of those things are obstacles to doing that, that someone with more resources uh, would be able to overcome. Next slide. Um, and so not surprisingly, black and indigenous people in particular um, are harmed by uh, the health effects. So we have a system, there's been a lot of reporting in the last few years, particularly on black maternal health, um, that black people are more likely to have complications in childbirth and to have, uh, to actually die because of complications of pregnancy. Um, the United States across the board, regardless of race, has the highest rate of uh, maternal mortality in the developed world among wealthy countries. Um, black people are three times as likely to die from those causes as white people. Indigenous people are twice as likely to die. Um, and particularly in those 26 states that are expected to criminalize abortion, um, those have the highest, even the, the United States as a country has higher rates than the rest of the world. Um, those states within the United States have some of the highest rates in the country. Um, and it's not surprising given that these are states that are also the least likely to invest in healthcare, to invest in childcare, housing, public health infrastructure, the basic things that we know improve health and well being uh, for people, children, families. Um, and so those are the states that are also most likely um, to criminalize abortion. Uh, next slide. And so moving beyond the health complications, even if you carry to term and give birth without any health issues, there are other consequences for someone who has sought an abortion and not been able to access it. Um, so there's a, uh, a set of studies that have been conducted over a number of years that found um, an increase in household po poverty that can last four or more years, increased debt, inability to cover basic expenses like food, housing, and transportation for people who are in a, a intimate partner or domestic violence situation. Um, the uh, not being able to access abortion can make it harder to escape that situation. So increases their risk of exposure. Um, and that impacts both the person seeking the abortion 
and their children. So all of this applies to poverty, the worst health rates, um, the being trapped in a domestic violence situation, all of those things apply to existing children as well. Uh, next slide. So all of that would be plenty. There are consequences of this decision beyond abortion if it were to be handed down by the court. Um, so just to give a little background on the legal reasoning in Roe. So in Roe v. Wade, the court held that under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, liberty includes, the word liberty includes a right to privacy. We have uh, that section one of the 14th Amendment laid out here, that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Um, and so that decision is part of uh, an area of the law that's called substantive due process. And it's basically the idea that there are some rights that are so fundamental that there is no amount of due process that can justify a state taking them away. So even if you had an attorney, even if you had a jury of your peers, all of the things that we think of when we think of due process, um, those things, if that's not enough, even if you get all those things, that some rights are so fundamental that they cannot be taken away. And the court found that the right to privacy is one of those fundamental rights and that row, the, the access to abortion uh, was part of the right to privacy. Our next slide. So by an, un, under the leaked decision, um, the Alito doesn't reject that idea, at least explicitly, that some rights are so fundamental. What he instead says is that those rights that are, are so fundamental that they can't be, um, there is no amount of due process sufficient to deprive a person of those rights. They have to be deeply rooted in US history. And his argument is that the right to privacy is not deeply rooted in US history. Um, so the access to ab abortion is not the only uh, right that falls under this right to privacy. Um, so the ability to marry uh, anyone you want to, regardless of gender or race, access to birth control, the right not to be sterilized by the state, among others, all of these things were um, found to be rights that people hold under this right to privacy. And so if the right to privacy is not included in our fundamental rights, um, all of these other things come into question as well. Next slide. And then so moving even beyond that, so beyond the right to privacy, um, the, the uh, substance of Alito's reasoning um, says that in order for something to be deeply rooted, to be part of our traditions, it has to be the, the uh, 60 years since Roe, 50 years since Roe, um, are not enough um, to consider it deeply rooted. Um, he takes us all the way back to 1868, which is when the 14th Amendment was ratified, and that the traditions of the 19th century um, have more power, are more protected by the Constitution than the traditions of the 21st or even the 20th century. Um, and that has larger implications for how we understand the rights of the Constitution, that if we are um, trapped in the traditions uh, from 200 years ago, um, we know that the only rights that were guaranteed at that time, that the, um, the only rights that are deeply rooted in the history of the United States are the rights of straight, white, landed men, landed meaning property owning men. Um, and so if those are the only rights that we're considering fundamental, there is a whole host, a whole range of rights that then come into question or a whole host of uh, traditional law that comes into question. Um, next slide. Right, I know that's a lot to digest there. Um, so let's talk about you know what we can do. So first thing, let's talk about abolishing the filibuster. So the filibuster is the Senate rule, um, which requires 60 members to end debate in order to bring uh, legislation to the floor to vote. So it essentially lets the minority party block legislation from advancing in the Senate. Um, it's inherently undemocratic and it's not part of the constitution. It's especially important to highlight how this has been used as a tool of white supremacy. Um, it's really rooted in anti-Black racism, in particular Southern senators efforts um, to preserve slavery, you know, up until the efforts to block the civil rights 
uh, civil rights legislation. You know, and today what this means is that 41 senators, um, which potentially represent as little as 11% of the overall population of this country can block um, most bills. And we know they've already done this, right? You know, they've used the filibuster to block really important gun violence prevention legislation, important legislation around immigration, the DREAM Act. Um, and of course, this threatens um, the future of the Women's Health Prevention Act, which would codify Roe. You know, essentially, as long as the filibuster remains in place, Mitch McConnell, you know, or his successor, although Mitch McConnell seems to maybe live forever, will use this to block, you know, democracy reforms, climate change legislation, immigrate, you know, immigrant uh, legislation, Medicare for all, debt-free college, uh, you know, we could go on and on. Uh, really, any progressive priority that you care about, you're working on, um, is, you know, will likely go up against the filibuster. So now is truly the time for Dems to act. This is the time to move. This is the time to finally abolish the filibuster. And if you're wondering, you know, but what about Republicans? What will they do? If they need to abolish the filibuster, they will. And it's important to remember that, in fact, you know, they kind of already have, right? In the case of Supreme Court justices, Mitch McConnell undid the 60 vote rule um, for Supreme Court nominees. That's how he was able to get Gorsuch on the bench. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can talk a minute about expanding the Supreme Court um, by passing the Judiciary Act. So, you know, similarly, just as the filibuster stands in the way of passing important progressive legislation, the Supreme Court threatens, you know, everything we've won thus far and everything we're fighting for, you know, so from Roe to Medicare for all, voting rights, it's all at stake, um, you know, and like I said, if we don't do this, really, this is the moment. And if we don't do it now, we really do stand to lose everything. Um, everything that Michelle just lined, uh, outlined, um, and potentially even more um, based on future decisions that could come down. So we know that we have this extremely partisan court, right? And it's not just a conservative court, it's a cons extremely conservative court. And we know that that's very dangerous. I know I don't have to um, convince you all of that. So the only real way that we have now to attempt to kind of rebalance the court is to add these four seats. But we also know that outside of, you know, this need to restore balance, there's also an extreme lack of diversity on the report. And we know that different voices are needed um, and what it could look like to have those voices in the room. We had a you know, rare win recently getting um, Justice Brown Jackson on the Supreme Court, which was, you know, obviously so exciting, but there's clearly still a very long way to go. And just think about how exciting it would be if we had four more seats to fill. It's also important to remember, you know, the, the like, you know, we talked about before, the size of the Supreme Court has shifted over time. And historically, the number of justices was set to the number of circuit courts. So over the years, you know, our population has grown, the circuit courts have expanded, but we haven't expanded the Supreme Court to match the number of circuit courts. So now we have justices um, overseeing cases from multiple circuit courts. I, you know, and we know that the constitution leaves it up to Congress to name the number of Supreme Court justices. And, you know, I feel deeply that Congress meeting this moment and deciding to expand the court and add these four seats is actually kind of doing exactly uh, what the constitution has laid out. Um, so if we go to the next side, you know, how are we gonna do all this? You know, of course, the answer for everything, um, we're going to organize. Um, sorry, can you go to the next? Yeah, great. Um, and I wanted to just take uh, a moment to kind of talk about some of the work this group has already done, you know, the work of the Center for Popular Democracy Action and our affiliates, and, you know, more specifically, some folks for sure in this call I know have been on the ground with us a number of times. These are just some pictures of some of our actions. Um, kind of in the top row on either end, we have some pictures here from the Kavanaugh fight. Of course, one of our former executive directors, Ana Maria Archila, um, confronting Jeff Flake. And it's just important to note, obviously, those protests didn't have the outcome that we had hoped. And, you know, Brett Kavanaugh sits on our highest court, but the protests still mattered. And, you know, creating that big moment um, around his confirmation was important in a lot of different ways. You know, we saw initially when he was um, nominated, it's so hard to even try to remember this at this point because it seems too wild. But a lot of people were saying for a Trump nominee that potentially he wasn't that bad. People actually expected it to be Amy Coney Barrett, but he kind of threw a wrench in and ended up in uh, nominating Kavanaugh. 
But anyway, we saw that narrative really shift. As people showed up in DC in mass, as people took action in their state, the narrative really did start to change. And we went from maybe he's not that bad till by the time he was confirmed, members of Congress calling for his impeachment. So, you know, we know that the work we did on the ground was important as we look at his, you know, integrity on the court and really the future of his, you know, what his decisions on the bench mean. Um, we also tried to play as much of a role as we could is trying to bring attention to the danger of Trump's judges overall. Remember that Trump was able to confirm over 200 judges um, in his four years, which is really terrifying. We're not gonna you know, really even see the total fruits of that for years to come, decades to come. They're gonna be on the bench for the next 30 to 40 years. Um, so that's definitely you know, going to talk about our progressive issues, everything from mass mandates, et cetera. These are Trump judges on the lower courts blocking um, these issues. So anyway, just quickly here um, on the bottom, uh, we see this woman getting arrested, Ruth, one of my heroes engaging in civil disobedience outside of a lower court nominee. For that nominee, we were able to have hundreds of people. I know some of you were there um, during this nominee's confirmation hearing. Um, I need to fact check this, but if not the biggest, certainly one of the biggest protests to ever happen outside of a lower court nominee confirmation process, it garnered a ton of press. We even had senators, Tim Kaine came up to me and was like, this is incredible. I've never seen so much press attention people are actually paying attention to these lower court justices so or judges. So although the judge in question, unfortunately, was confirmed, um, we brought attention to the issue that otherwise wouldn't be there because of this, you know, the protests that we engaged in. In the top center to, you know, another Trump judges kind of action that we did, you can see folks shirt are talking about Brown versus Board of Education. Um, we were saying then, this was, you know, back, I think, 2018, 19, that that was on the line and people thought that that was kind of wild that we would even suggest that. Um, but now we know, unfortunately, that we are right, that it potentially, you know, really is on the line. And of course, that's the case that desegregated our schools. And Trump was intentionally <coughs> putting forth nominees who wouldn't say whether Brown versus Board of Education was set of law. Republicans were voting for those, you know, uh, nominees overwhelmingly, but so were Democrats. So some of our members engaged in civil disobedience outside their offices, particularly the Democrats. Again, you know, we got press attention. This went on Twitter and people started to look and say, you know, why is my Democratic senator voting to confirm a judge <coughs> who has this opinion about something that should have been settled, you know, was settled decades ago in this country's history? Um, and we saw almost immediately, at least some of those Democrats changing their votes. They got a lot of bad press, and so they started acting differently. Um, this woman here um, holding her child, asking a question. Um, one of our you know, bread and butter tools here at CPD, bird dogging. If you don't know what bird dogging is, we'd love to do a free training on that. But a lot of times it just means showing up to a town hall, raising your hand, and asking a really great question, which is something you know, we've done a lot of around expanding the court before the Judiciary Act existed in Congress. We spent a couple years working on Dems, showing up to campaign events all over the country, asking them about expanding the court, asking them particularly about Roe and what they were going to do and would they expand the court to save Roe. Um, and we saw, you know, Supreme Court wasn't an issue that was talked about very much in many stump speeches, you know, initially in the last presidential election, but after we showed up to a campaign event, after a campaign event, people were weaving it into their speeches. They were talking even not just about the dangers of the Supreme Court, but they were mentioning, you know, the need to at least study reform and look at the possibility of adding seats. And I know that our bird dogging played um, really a huge role in that. And that's something that we'll continue to do as we look to the midterm. So this summer, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to bird dog with us. Um, just quickly, two more points here um, uh, for Union Station in DC by the police. The Federalist Society, which is one of these bad actors, and Michelle was talking about the decades long takeover of the court. These are one of the groups funding that, you know, just huge dark money right group um, that has been responsible, you know, for a number of our judges, a number of our current Supreme Court justices have really close ties to the Federalist Society. Um, and it's not something that a lot of people know about. And so this particular year, Kavanaugh was the keynote speaker. So we knew we had to go. 
we knew we had to interrupt some of our members. We rented tuxes, were able to sneak in, get into the event. When Kavanaugh went to give a speech, they stood up, they proclaimed they still believe Dr. Ford. They blew rape whistles, which was something that we used during his um, confirmation hearings where they you know, had to totally pause the event and shut down for a moment um, as they escorted our <clears throat> members out. And this was a moment, it was you know a big viral moment on social media, got a lot of media hits. Again, what's really the point of all that is because people were hearing about the Federalist Society for the first time, especially different audiences. You know, we were in things like Teen Vogue and Jezebel the year before the same event, I think had one press hit in the Washington Post, you know, and now these videos are trending on Twitter and people are learning about this really for the first time. And that includes, you know, we put out on our press release that Google had bought a table at this event, was helping to fund the Federalist Society. And staff at Google were hearing about this for the first time, you know, via our Twitter, essentially, um, and decided to organize internally um, as the staff and put pressure on management to stop funding the Federalist Society. Um, finally, here on the bottom, this picture of a protest with um, Alito's large face, which maybe was some unfortunate foreshadowing, but that was actually outside of the Dobbs oral arguments in DC. We were there supporting the work of abortion providers, um, patients and allies. We engaged in civil disobedience um, during the oral arguments. Um, and we show up often in front of oral arguments. And then again, um, on, you know, of course, decision days. So um, if you move to the next slide, I'll talk about some steps to take now. Um, you know, we expect this decision will come down, you know, in the next month. Monday, unfortunately, is a decision day. So we'll be watching that closely. Um, but it could happen really in the next few weeks, potentially even into early July. Um, so some things that you can do now, if you haven't already, if everyone could just take a moment, you know, get out your cell phone, open up you know, your web browser, another tab, and go to our Facebook group, which actually let me get that link right now and I'll put it in the chat. But it's facebook.com slash group slash CPD court reformers. Um, and the name of the group currently is um, Protect Abortion, Expand the Supreme Court. So we would love for you to join that group. It's just a great way to, you know, organize with us, stay in touch with us. You know, there's new abortion bans popping up every other day, voting bans. Uh, there's a lot to keep up with. So it's a great place where we can all kind of stay in communication together and we have membership all across the country. Um, so it's just a great place for people to organize, strategize, collaborate together there. Um, I'm also gonna throw another link into the chat. Um, if you go to SCOTUS, which stands for Supreme Court of the United States, .cpdaction.org, you'll be taken to a form um, you can just let us know how you want to get involved in this fight. You know, there's going to be a lot of mass mobilizations, big marches in D.C. in the next couple weeks. If you can go to those, great, let us know. But if you can't, there's so many other ways to get involved, totally equally as important sometimes, you know, maybe even moving the needle more um, by some actions that you can take in state, you know, or even from your home. So lobbying is going to be crucial. Uh, we'll be lobbying on, you know, both abolishing the filibuster and expanding the Supreme Court. We'll totally train you. You know, it happens over Zoom. You can do it from home. You can do it when you're available. We'll schedule it around your time. We'll go into the meeting with you. Um, we've been doing a ton of phone banks. We'll continue doing that. There's going to be a lot of really cool bird dogging opportunities coming up this summer and into the fall. Um, the link isn't working. Okay, we'll try to troubleshoot that. Um, but there's lots of different ways to get involved. You know, those are just a handful of, of the very many ways we're going to use all the tools, you know, in our activists toolbox um, to stay engaged on this issue. Um, so we just definitely invite you all to take action um, with us. Um, and with that, I just want to th say thank you all so much um, for joining and just hope that this is, you know, the beginning of many more conversations and I'll put my email in the chat, you know, please reach out to me anytime. But thank you all so much for joining.